So it is now my pleasure to be able to introduce a um, person that I have a great deal of respect uh, and appreciation for. It's Jennifer Larson. She's a senior arts fellow for uh, arts and humanities policy at the Rockefeller Institute. And she's going to be conducting uh, the uh, montages and the discussions that are going to follow. Jennifer. Hello, everybody. It's so great to see you. <laughs> see what you look like. I've, I've been emailing and in some cases have spoken with you on the phone. Um, this I, is our third year for the SUNY Pride uh, celebration and um, the first time that it's been virtual. Um, one thing I want to mention to you is that this is going to go pretty fast. Each artist will have about two minutes or so, but the artwork lives on on our Pride website for an entire year, suny.edu backslash pride. Um, you could just Google SUNY Pride and you come and you get there as well. Um, this year we had 29 people contributing works. Uh, some people contributed multiple works and they came from 12 campuses. They range from video, music performance and composition, writing, experimental film, photography, digital art, writing and painting and drawing. And um, I am just totally in awe of all of you. We're going to start with a montage of the photographic works. As you can see, they're, they're quite varied and really beautiful. Not all of the photogra photographers could be with us today, uh, but three are. And we're going to start with Massimo Avanzato from FIT. And his photograph is Hector and Lance. I'm hoping, Massimo, that you can tell us the backstory about this beautiful photograph and tell us a little about um, what you were hoping to convey with it. Yeah, so um, this picture was taken in January um, of this year. And I go to Arizona usually every winter break to visit my siblings. So this time I brought like a whole suitcase of my gear because um, I really wanted to go up to random strangers and kind of take pictures of people even though I'm super shy. Um, so people I actually met on New Year's Eve at this um, queer dance party. And so there was tons of um, LGBT couples and people. And <clears throat> I asked them that night, like, can I take pictures of you um, sometime before I leave? And they were really interested and really wanted some nice pictures of them together. So it was kind of um, like a win-win for both of us. And I feel like it's important because it shows that being part of the community doesn't look one way and couples that are LGBT don't look one way. Um, there can be different age groups, different ethnicities, um, gender expressions. So for me, it was important to capture a real couple that um, I just happened to run into that night. Well, it's a beautiful photograph, really. Um, I have I have a follow up question. I'm wondering about um, who you view as your audience. So when you take a photograph like this, is it are you hoping to move the general public into thinking more openly and more acceptingly? Are you hoping to produce images that um, the LGBTQ community will see and identify with? Are you doing some of both? Um, I think it's more the first option. And I think um, when I started to figure out my sexuality and gender identity, I wanted to normalize it kind of and show the general public that there is people in the world that are like me. And um, that's kind of what I do with all of my art. So for me, I want to normalize LGBT people and um, I want to normalize my experience and show the diversity of, of everybody in the world. So I think for me, it's more of like a art as activism and more of um, showing people that might not see my community what it looks like. 
Um, there, there will be time for those of you who'd like to ask a, another, ask a question. You can also use the chat and privately chat with any of the artists or writers if you like. Okay, so the next, thank you, by the way, Massimo, I really love that piece. Thanks. Um, Yuan Ilano uh, from, fin from Fredonia uh, is the next photographer. This piece or this series of three photographs is called Getting Into Drag. Um, I was curious about your artistic statement where you say that, well, the art category you listed too. You listed makeup artist and photographer. So I'm wondering whether you identify more as a makeup artist or more as a photographer or both. So Firstly, I identify as a drag artist, so I feel that that encompasses a multitude of different art forms from photography to fashion to makeup to anyone, pretty much anything, directing as well. Um, through these three pieces, I decided that I wanted to capture the essence of drag in my art form as Fallon Angel through photography because I felt that it would really encapsulate who I was as an artist to so see the steps that it takes to become Fallon Angel, to become my drag persona. Well, they're, they're incredible, especially the splash of pink. They're so joyful and really incredible. So, Thank you. <laughs> so who is your intended artist in your photographs um, when you are exhibiting these works? Who do you hope sees them? I, I really want to be a leader for the new world that we are going moving forward to. I want to be an activist and my audience really is um, all people, primarily people who are just like me. I want to represent the Filipinos, the Asian community, the Pacific Islanders. I want to represent all the people that I didn't have growing up. I didn't have these figures growing up to look at and to be uh, wanting to be like. So I want to be able to show people that through my art form, that we can use and amplify our platforms to be the people who we truly intend to be and who we are created to be. Have other artists uh, been influential in your work? Um, artists that are influential in my work, um, I don't think that I have a direct like one person or like a set few people. I really take in experiences as my influences, whether it is through like film or television or through like the beauty of like the Filipino culture. Um, I guess for these photo sets, I would like to say that my biggest um, inspirations were the Miss Universe pageantry. Um, I take a lot of inspiration from pageantry and because of the huge fan base in the Philippines, I love to exude beauty and gracefulness, but also with a heart at the core of it. Thank you, you explained yourself very well. Thank yeah, you so much. For sure. Um, so the next, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a delight to meet you in, in <laughs> virtually like this. Um, Morgan Paul from Alfred University. Um, Morgan's work is called Who Wears the Pants? We have a couple of works in the, in the uh, virtual gallery by Morgan, but this particular one was the one I chose for today. I chose it because um, of your use of humor that is so uh, clever and delightful. And I'm hoping maybe you would talk about that humor and the way you employ it in your artwork. Uh, yeah, I know for my work in particular and this uh, one piece, um, it was really kind of fueled by me noticing how what I wore affected um, what people perceive my gender to be because um, mm -hmm. I do like wearing these very old patterns and I noticed a lot of blue in my own work and in my own clothing but I also noticed that people either tended to um, assume my gender and I kind of really wanted to play with the fact of um, I'm still questioning my own gender identity as well. Um, but I ultimately found it humorous when people couldn't always tell directly what gender I am. 
because I believe I am more fluid than anything. Um, so I really kind of wanted to express that sort of playfulness in my work as well because I'm kind of going through that playfulness of finding myself. Um, and that is really kind of what I wanted to show to other people and kind of also say it's okay to not necessarily figure yourself all out at once. It's all right to play. Mm -hmm. And it can be a pretty joyful experience even as much of, as it is a very emotional one. I was noticing uh, in the image that was uh, shown that you know, that image deals a great deal with pattern, distinctive patterns, uh, and then one pattern uh, superimposed on another pattern, uh, superimposed on another pattern. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if there might be any symbolic uh, interpretation of that that would be useful. Yeah, I know with that particular um the layering pattern on pattern at the time I was making that I was looking at um, specifically the camouflage used on dazzle ships in World War One, and kind of that act of wearing so much that catches your eye that you kind of hide yourself in the process. And I tend to do that with even my own clothing that I wear day to day. So that was really kind of my way to play with hiding my own gender, but also exploring it at the same time. That makes sense. I love it. I think it is marvelous, really. So thank you, Morgan. Thank you. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, so we are going to go to the next section, which is drawing and painting. As you can see, they're really varied. All different styles. So the first artist uh, is Camille. Uh, I hope I say the last name right, Busemi, uh, with the work called Happy Pride. Uh, Camille is from New Buffalo. And um, Hopefully, there we go. Um, I'm hoping that you can tell us a little about the ways in which you find yourself responding to current events, the current political and social environment, and um, and and a little about this image and what you're hoping to convey with it. Um, I think there's a lot going on right now with everything, like in the U.S. and around the world, of course. And I just, uh, my art, I want it to be like hopeful in a sense and like more optimistic and like better than what's around. So I wanted to like incorporate myself to like share my story. Um, and I'm bisexual, so I wanted to clarify that. And I wanted to incorporate like people of color in this too, because they're misrepresented in a lot of ways and not represented in um, like everything at this point, but we need more representation for people of color and people in the LGBTQ um, community. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I just wanted to be very hopeful for the future and hopefully it'll get better in a lot of ways. So is that is that your your general um, approach to art in general is that you try to portray things as you would like to see them? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I would, I mean, it's kind of like my escape from everything. I've like always been an artist my whole life, basically. So uh, this is just one I want to continue to do throughout my life and hopefully like inspire other people to do the same. Well, I love it. It does feel very hopeful. <laughs> I noticed that the uh, format for this particular image uh, it tends to remind me of, of art that one would see in a, in a graphic novel. Uh, did you intend anything uh, 
about that choice of format? Is it intentional or is that just kind of the way you find yourself uh, making art? Um, I'm actually an oil painter mostly, but for the time being, I wanted to do digital art because it was a lot, like a lot quicker than doing oil paintings. So that's what I chose for it. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, that was wonderful. Um, our next artist um, is Daniel Donato, and his work is the Pride Flag. Oh, Daniel is from Stony Brook. Um, yeah, he's pulling it up now. So, Daniel, you had made such a, a great statement about flags and why you choose why you chose to paint a flag in addition to the pride flag and the role of flags in in social identity. And I'm hoping that you might talk a little about that. Um, sure. Hi. Um, so my name is Dan. Uh, yeah, um, I, I come from a military based family. Um, militaries in uh, from South America and North America. And we take uh, great prides in flags. We are not collectors of flags, but uh, we cherish flags in frames. Uh, so we receive flags from our loved ones when they pass on. And flags are folded up carefully, put into glass pieces. And these flags are put onto uh, on shelves to for display for us to cherish. And when I was thinking about this exhibition, um, I wasn't sure what to make, and um, and I like to just say that I'm not a member of the LGBTQI community at all. I don't even have family from this community, but I've been so inspired by the SUNY system of creating this exhibition, and I wanted to just, like a flag, just uh, show my presence and just acknowledging such uh, great success that I think it's been uh, happening over the years, uh, even though there's a lot more work to do as far as equality. Did I answer your question enough or? No, you did, you did. Um, and I, I love the way you've rendered it here with such motion and um, it feels very alive. It's really quite, quite wonderful. I think you were, you were very effective in terms of communicating your involvement and uh, your passion. And uh, I think the work uh, is easier for me to understand having had the opportunity to listen to you. So thank you. Um, so our next artist, yeah, thank you, Daniel. Our next artist is Rebecca Gomez from FIT. Um, Rebecca's work is called Transformation. Um, for me, this is a very sensitive depiction, um, and I, it, it elicits a, a lot of sympathy or, or um, warm feelings toward the person in the, in the painting. Um, Rebecca, I'm hoping that you might tell us a little about what you were trying to communicate to the viewer with this work. Uh, so transformation captures the essence of acceptance. And as my friend Jordan celebrates the transgender journey from a physical transformation to an emotional and psychological transformation, becoming transgender has given him the freedom to express himself in an honest way. And being part of the LGBTQ community demonstrates a level of honesty and also openness in order to achieve happiness and joy and self-actualization. Um, so in this painting, Jordan celebrates the transformation as he pr proudly displays the colors of the transgender flag. And his transformation has only begun and I'm proud to call him this friend, my friend. It's really quite lovely. Thank you. So the next, the next artist is Tyler Joseph from Stony Brook. And his work is entitled MAGA. So this impresses me a great deal for its powerful political and social statement. And I'm very interested, Tyler, in knowing uh, about the other works that you do. And if this is 
if this is um, something you find yourself uh, creating art in response or, or with uh, a statement you wish to make, or whether this is an exception um, to a process that uh, is more general for you. Right, right. Well, hello, everyone, first of all. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, so yeah, I was gonna say it's actually it's really funny that you asked that. Um, because I don't outwardly like consider myself a political artist. Um, I never really like set out specifically with the uh, intentions to make my art like about politics. Um, but then like, <laughs> in reflecting like over the past uh, year, specifically last semester, um, I found that most of my work has like at least some sort of political influence in it. Um, so, you know, after like I had gotten that question, I was like, oh, I was trying to think about why that was maybe. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, well, that's that's perfectly ironic because the whole um, the whole point of this piece was to talk about the unavoidability of um, just the current political environment. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, it's kind of like an attest, uh, a testament to my inability as like a queer person to get away from these ideals and the social climate that um, our current administration fosters. Um, so yeah, the, that's why I kind of like the concept um, of like why MAGA was like carved or um, scarred into the skin um, in like an intentionally like non-consensual looking way. Um, but yeah, so I, I would say that I consider myself like a, a strong conceptual thinker. Um, so I always try to incorporate like that into my work. Um, and then I, with that said, I would say that like, obviously it's kind of been on, been on my, a lot of people's minds for the past uh, couple of years. So, um, so yeah, I would say that uh, it kind of happened in a um, unintentional way, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was That's going to ask you <laughs> I was going to ask you about <clears throat> the letters that, that appeared to be stars, but you answered my question before I had <laughs> to ask it. So thank you. Of course. Yeah. 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 Would you tell us how, uh, how you uh, handled the medium? Um, um, so yeah, actually it's, I, it was kind of perfect. I, I used um, uh, dry point etching on Intaglio, um, Intaglio prints. Um, and I did that because I, I knew that the line quality in that would be like very like carved almost. Um, so I spent I spent a lot of time mostly like working with the concept of it. And then I was like thinking of how I could make that line quality represent that kind of like chaotic frustration um, in, in the, the cross hatching, I would say. And then in the uh, actual MAGA letters, like I was like, like actually like carving it out with it. Um, so yeah, I kind of thought that the medium fit the, uh, the emotion behind it. I think your choice of a medium um, is very effective in terms of what we're communicating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so um, our next artist is Griffin Lacey from U Albany, And Griffin's work is called Petrie Submersion. There it is. Um, so this for me is a very strong statement about fertility. Um, it looks, it looks like something in a laboratory. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, how your identity influences your creative choices and the subject matter you choose to use as, um, the basis of your visual work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a genderqueer, non-binary, intersectional feminist, I incorporate my identity and my own experiences in, in all of the work that I create. And I often approach them from a conceptual point of view. And with this project, the Eggs and Hooks project, it started out um, as an exploration of fertility um, and gender identity and reproduction. And I was think I do a lot of trans activism or activism with trans youth. And I learn a lot about their experiences with fertility and their parent, their parents' fears related to fertility preservation and technology related to fertility and fertility preservation. And I also experience my own struggle with fertility myself as a genderqueer person. And so this is a based on an image of an ICSI procedure, which is a process involved in IVF, where there is a technological innovation or intervention to help 
people become parents. And the hook um, represents sort of the ambiguous and mysterious nature of the process of becoming a parent when you are a gender queer person or you have to experience particular struggles um, to achieve parenthood, depending on your own situation, whether it it can be a person who is or is not LGBTQ, but often people who are LGBTQ kind of uh, face some of these challenges more often, especially trans folks, um, and experience the technological invasion in some ways of fertility, while it's also an exciting and privileged thing to be able to figure out ways that technology can support reproduction for LGBTQ families and families to be. Well, it's really, really a very strong image and um, and a really important idea. Um, as I imagine that is a fear that families of LGBTQ um, uh, children worry about, especially. I think you did an excellent job of explaining yourself too. So thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for sharing the works and for giving us this platform. I really appreciate it. So nice to see everyone's work. So our next artist is Tyler Normel from FIT and the work is called Liberation. Um, so this is, this is a, a historic event that's depicted here, I assume, Tyler. And I'm wondering if you might talk about that. Yes, the two people in the painting depicted are Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. Marsha P. Johnson is known for throwing her shot glass at the Stonewall riot. Um, after the events of the riots, they founded the group STAR, which was street transvestite action revelation. And they really were the founders of the modern gay rights movement. I did this painting when I was building up my portfolio to become a fine arts major. And I knew going into it, I wanted to honor these two women that I learned about because I was so excited to finally learn about the background of this community. And especially in high school, I was my high school's GSA president. And I hadn't learned about these figures until I was about like, a freshman or sophomore in college, so it just meant a lot to finally learn about it and be able to celebrate it. So is there, I, I just have a question, um, is there a, a monument to them uh, in Manhattan? Besides the actual Stonewall Bar and the proximity to Christopher Street, I, I don't believe so, I don't know for sure. Um, but I know Stonewall just in general stands as a monument for, I think that whole night and that whole experience. Mm -hmm. And I mean, New York and Manhattan in general really was like the epicenter of pride and just like where it was really born. Even though obviously transgenderism has existed since the beginning of time, I think Marsha P. Johnson coming to the forefront along with Sylvia Rivera really gave the mainstream the opportunity to look at you know these types of people and finally be like they're doing something good for the world and they're really making a movement unfortunately marcia was murdered in the 70s sylvia lived well into the 2000s continuing the activism and they've done a lot and i just wanted to honor them and i think especially with the state that the world is in right now we are remembering the impact that trans women of color really have left on this movement and in the world. Last year for World Pride, I think I really, for because I've walked in Pride for about three years in a row. And I think the last year was the first time I realized that Pride's get, Pride was getting very corrupt in the way that it was just very commercialized and they were just wanting to put like, you know, their sponsors first. I was walking with uh, my old high school because I was DSA president. And it was the first time uh, my high school was allowed to just walk alone they, like they would have to be with um, Staten Island Pride Center or you know, someone else to get allowed. But for the first year that they were allowed to just walk as Cottonwood High School, 
they were pushed to the side so the major companies and corporations could go first. So I think with what happened this year, it at least has been an eye opener for us to remember the origins of this movement and really honor that and move forward really celebrating that because even after the Stonewall riots happened, trans women of color did still fall back down the social ladder. So it's incredible to be able to bring back their legacy today. Yeah, I'm really glad you did. I was really happy to see this piece. So thank you, Tyler. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the next artist is Shanti Rooney from New Paltz. Um, so this piece is called Soar 2 and is it's beautiful. I, I'm wondering um, about the model in this in this painting and um, and what the inspiration was for this work. Um. Um, these uh, select uh, three blocks all from the south, um, all named the south. Why I uh, called them, they are named south because I want to have this other, uh, have this double meaning. One is uh, um, the creative south, really south at uh, open environment where. Uh, support diversity, equality, or uh, inclusion, like um, LGBTQ uh, society in like SUNY Albany and SUNY New Parts. We have really vibrant uh, um, LGBTQ community. Um, and like SUNY New Parts, they have all genders restrooms, they have Ravana, a Rivera uh, house. And they always have open plan. Those people can. I I like this uh, other partner of ours kind of things. And uh, and another meaning I try to suggest the gender's liberty, uh, uh, like uh, the uh, various different uh, genders identity. Uh, they I. Uh, nowadays, they they are get uh, they get rid of uh, spiritual shackles. Um, they have a freedom to pursue their dream, um, to follow their passion, to live on their own beliefs. Um, this is the why I called them so. Um, most. Um, uh, uh, my subject of protagonist, they are uh, like a white three or they are artist, uh, so, uh, like uh, active in uh, like active with artist, uh, like this person uh, in, my, in my work, she's um, interdisciplinary active with uh, she did a lot of uh, provocative uh, performance and some featured in the uh, museum in New York City. Uh, she's named Rosary Salimento, Rosary Salimento. Uh, I want to uh, celebrate that kind of uh, freedom and also uh, describe those, uh, those person. Um, like I pursue poetic and symbolic quality. Uh, I use the water in this work because water people um, the water um, flexible, tender and also changeable effective um, and they they also tenacious uh, water can uh, uh, erode a stone so I use the water to suggest uh, some uh, in the quality uh, we uh, we uh, appreciate very much your explanation and um, the uh, involvement that you're going into. 
Uh, I wish we had more time, but, but unfortunately we don't. Uh, do you have any final words? No? Um, you mean uh, other fun works? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, your uh, uh, commentary and uh, very nice to have the, the image. I think it's beautiful. I do too. So I just want to remind you all that if you have a question for any of the artists or want to connect with them, feel free to do the private chat. And I want to um, excuse the background noise here. I have a couple of violinists that I live with. And, <laughs> and they're down the hall. They're down the hall. Um, I'll mute myself when I'm not talking. We have one more image. This one is Heather Weston from Stony Brook. And this piece is called, um, I want to say her and I, let's see. Got it. <laughs> I got it. I got it right. Yeah. I think it's very beautiful and it's incredible that it, this is a drawing, right? It's, um, so you spoke in your, or you write in your, in your um, information about this work that um, you want your pieces not to be identifiably what uh, feminine or masculine or or trans or LGBTQ. You want it to be somehow um, uh, beyond that. And I'm wondering if you might talk about that. <laughs> well, holding hands can be a very courageous gesture depending on where you are and who you are with. Uh, my partner is Albanian. Uh, she's from Kosovo, which is a very Muslim region. Um, we visit there maybe yearly. And uh, we also not only struggle with our relationship there, but um, also being women in general. Uh, women don't have any rights and for the most part, you know, need men or more of a masculine figure to uh, escort us outside of the house. Um, I was saying with uh, femininity and androgyny. Um, when we go overseas, we have to kind of robe ourselves um, to kind of shield what we actually are, which is androgynous. My partner is uh, very masculine and could probably come across as a man. Um, but with saying that, I uh, we visit Tirana a lot, which is a major city in Albania. And uh, they're kind of gaining more rights to women. And they even started their own LGBTQ community. Um, and only maybe two years ago did killing a gay person became illegal. Um, to counteract that, uh, they had their first gay pride parade also in the past year for World Pride. But also with um, wearing dresses and kind of um, performing a feminine role. Um, we realize there is an underground uh, body of queer people who dress as women or pass as men to keep them their identity safe. So sometimes you don't know actually who you are speaking to. Yeah, that is an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Um, I lived for eight years in uh, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates and um, you know, with the, the robes high, hide a person's identity pretty effectively. And I don't, I, I don't know, but I found that fascinating. Yeah, and I think in turning, talking about the current climate too, uh, with wearing face coverings now uh, really rings true to my practice and my interest in identity uh, shielding. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for a very powerful work. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I'm so happy that you guys were brave and um, it takes some effort to uh, submit works to, through a platform like Submittable. Um, and I really, I, I'm so thankful to all of you. Um, our next category is in music and we'll do a montage uh, of of the works and videos. There are also some videos in there that were submitted. Um, these, of course, are longer than what you'll see when he, when the montage plays through it. Um, you get to hear about a minute of each of them, maybe. And uh, But they're up on the Pride website, and you can go back and see all of them. 
and watch them many times if you like. There once was a little jelly bean. That was born into a loving family. The little jelly bean was loved so much. When the little jelly bean was born, the family all circled around and celebrated. It's a near. so happy that they named the little jelly bean that very day and brought the little jelly bean home to the big jar of tears. I don't iron his shirts. I don't sew on his buttons. I don't know all the jokes he tells or the songs he hums Though I may hold him all through the night He may not be here when the morning comes I don't pick out his ties or expect his tomorrows But I feel when he's in my arms He's where he wants to be We have no memories Bittersweet with time And I doubt if he'll spend the Lord with a sweet and somber major chord gently swaying to his organ piece in his light blue button down without a single crease and no one knows that last night he danced at the bar Across the state line And no one knows That he sang along To pumping 80s pop And no one knows he um, We're going to start with Bill Doherty Who is a professor at SUNY Cortland uh, And elsewhere <laughs> And uh, I, my question for Bill, who sings in that piece, um, I want you to tell us about your photos. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I have been collecting um, gay and uh, they used they call it 
um, affectionate photos of men for about 30 years. And I have probably about 5,000 different photos that were taken of very brave young men back in the day who were um, able to get photographs taken of themselves. And for any of you who were born before the digital age, we used to not be able to even get our photos developed at a photo mat if they had questionable material in them. So these guys would have photos taken and, and, and take a risk of just, you know, being able to have their images shown together. And so, you know, through the internet and through other fellow collectors and the things that I've gotten from eBay and in antique stores, that's where they come from. Well, they're super cool. So you, you sing in this piece, would, where, this, is, this is a work from a musical, right? 50%. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a little about that? Well, it was originally introduced by Dorothy Loudon in the, uh, the musical Ballroom, which was based on uh, the Stardust Ballroom uh, movie, if you know what that is. And the lyrics are by Marilyn and Alan Bergman, who are two of my favorite lyricists, and Barbara Streisand has sung a lot of their songs. But what I love the best about this is it talks about the, um, the unrequited yet valid love of uh, two people that don't happen to be married. Now, Dorothy introduced it in the, in the musical, of course, as a female uh, talking about dating or, or seeing a married man. But I knew Dorothy, and I told her that one day I wanted to sing this song. And she goes, wait until I'm dead, darling. It's mine. <laughs> and she passed. Uh, I started using it. And I've sung it in concert before, and uh, I recorded it for my album. And I just I love the bravery of it. Uh, because it does speak about, I don't wear his ring, I don't share his name, there's no piece of paper saying that he's mine. I love that. So I think it, it, it speaks so well for those of us who have had to live lives just beneath the surface, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's beautiful, just beautiful. Thank you. It is beautiful. I, uh, you explain yourself very well. I just simply have to share my admiration for the work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's gorgeous, and we'll get to hear um, more from Bill later. Uh, he's multi-talented. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next musician is Jean Golan, and um, her work is, she's a pianist, a piano professor at Nassau Community College. She's also the piano partner of a good friend of mine who is a cellist. Um, and the work she's playing is in this, uh, in this clip that you saw was Fantasy for Shredni Vashtar, I hope I said this right, which is a creepy story. Um, so I'm hoping, Jean, that you'll tell us about how you came to perform this work and about the composer. Absolutely. Um, the composer is Jorge Martin, who I went to college with and um, He's, uh, um, he's, he's a gay Cuban, wonderful pianist and composer, came here, I believe, when he was eight years old. And um, in his music, there's always, there's always some subversiveness. Um, so um, this is a piece that was actually written for me. Um, he had written a, an opera based on some of this um, some of this music. The, the tale is based on a, a Saki tale about um, a poor orphan boy who is taken in by his, um, his curmudgeonly aunt and uh, the only friend that he ends up making is a ferret um, that he sees in the barn and she tells him to never go there but then he starts deifying the ferret and, and creating rituals for the ferret to be powerful and make and take his aunt away. And by the end of the story, uh, it's unclear whether it was the the uh, a ferret bite or some deity that actually gets his aunt to <laughs> to die, and he's able to have tea with jam the way he wanted in the first place. Um, so uh, so Jorge wrote this for me, and. Um, and in, um, and in working out the project, after I had worked it into my fingers, um, I had this wonderful artist friend, Matt Friedman, who I believe is viewing today as well, um, who does lightning sketch artistry, meaning that 
he works out the drawing of the story. And this one had uh, eight panels, I believe, that we worked out timed to the music. And he does this amazing, uh, amazing, like if, if he wants the, the expression to be more astounding, he'll take the eyes and then he'll add around them at a point in the music where that's supposed to happen. And, and so the fancifulness, but also the, um, the, uh, the subversiveness of Jorge's music and Matt's drawing. And it, uh, it's, uh, it was a really wonderful experience to have this uh, added, uh, you know, added to my repertoire and be able to bring it out to the world. So that's uh, its story. <laughs> I have to say it's super cool. The artwork included, I, I would have loved to have been there in person. I hope I get a chance to see it performed live sometime, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Just really cool. Really cool. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it very much myself. And uh, I, I, I don't know, it just gave well, the whole experience of you and the others that we've had a chance to interact with. It just made me feel much better. So thank you. Well, we do want more and more of that, don't we? <laughs> Thank you for putting all of this together. It's a fantastic collection. Uh, we'll have to do more of this sort of thing. I just, I'm just astounded at how fun it has been to see what everyone has done, um, really. So um, our next contributor is Katya Stanislavskaya. I hope I said your name right, Katya. And Katya is on faculty at New College, and her composition was Sunday Morning Fall. Um, Katya, I'm hoping that you can tell us what prompted you to compose this piece. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned somewhere along the line that you have a student who wants to perform it. So um, I guess my question is, when you compose pieces, are you thinking about who will perform it? And, um, and what it might mean to the performer. Hi, everybody. Great. Thank you for all of your great work. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, the, the writing of the piece and the performance were actually removed from each other by more than a, I wouldn't say a decade, but several years. Uh, the piece was marinating in me for about a decade when I was a young 20-something. I was a staff accompanist, a, a pianist at the Interlochen Arts Camp, and it was my first time meeting people who were not urban and northeastern and people from all over America. And the closest friendship I formed there was with a young man from West Virginia who was a church organist in addition to his other gigs, and he was not out to his family, not out to his parish, not out to his colleagues, and he would literally have to go across state lines into Pennsylvania in order to go to a gay club or on a date with his partner. And so I, I couldn't believe, you know, in the early 2000s that this was still happening. And it took me about 10 years to realize how moved I was by the story. And about 10 years later, I wrote the song called Sunday Morning Paul, and I I wrote it from the point of view of an imaginary partner of my of my friend whom I call Paul in the song, you know, because it rhymes well, um, and uh, how the partner of someone who's closeted would feel about having to hide their relationship. And so since I met my friend initially, I've changed direction in my uh, career in a way. I started out as a classical pianist and I moved entirely to musical theater, but this song pays homage to our mutual classical background and to the fact that the character plays the organ. But then in the middle sections, as you heard a little bit, there's a reference to pop music because when he does feel free, when he goes to those clubs across state lines, that's his music at that moment. And then um, I used to teach in rural North Carolina where a lot of students really could not come out to their families either, and this was 10 or 15 years later. And sometimes they would come to me, even though I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community, but they knew I was from New York and I had a more liberal state of mind. And so they would come to me and I actually assigned it to one of my students named Alex Rost, who has since come out and is leading a happy life in New York City as an actor. But as a young student coming to terms with his uh, sexuality, he, he sang this song and I'd like to hope that it had some effect on the man that he is today. Very, very 
this explanation and, and the work is uh, very nice even without the explanation, but uh, it's, it's nice to have it, so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was part of the UNC system, uh, Western Carolina University. It's almost in Tennessee. It's on, in the mountains, really in the middle of nowhere. Asheville is the closest city. I use quotes. <laughs> you, oh, so it'd be like UNC Asheville. Okay. Um, yeah, it's about 50 miles from there. category is writing and um, instead of doing a montage we are going to ask the writers who have contributed works to read uh, read from their pieces some of them are poems and um, and and fairly short and some of them are excerpts and the first one is Ian Callahan and his poem is called homework um, so I'll let you read it, and Ian, and then uh, I have some follow-up questions. Great, thank you. Homework. For your sake, for their sake. Marginalized makes it seem like my days are unbearable. That the swish of my hips elicits slurs from car windows, and that my intimacy is dismissed, or worse, sanitized. All of these things have been true, but it would be a lie to suggest that my pain resembles any color other than white. We have a history of taking up space. As we rise up again, may we step aside to listen, to learn, to let love come through. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, so my question for you is how you view your role as an LGBTQ poet during this time of increased awareness of struggle and uh, the struggle for social and racial justice, um, which your poem alludes to, right? So I hope you might speak about that. Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think so much of the poem uh, attempts to embody the idea of being an accomplice rather than an ally in this uh, fight for racial justice and this, this transition to a new world, as a previous artist mentioned. Um, and I think that distinction is really key, this idea of being an active participant in dismantling systems of prejudice and disempowerment. Um, and I think that as a white person and as a queer white person, um, that requires a lot of listening and a lot of attention and a lot of uh, deliberate and thoughtful conversation that prioritizes voices that haven't been heard. And I think we're very fortunate uh, in the queer community by and large uh, for how much we have gained, I think, in terms of our civil liberties. And there's still obviously more to fight for, but I think in this moment, we really need to take the time to listen to our most marginalized members of our community, especially now, uh, and, and be there and be able to help and step up. So I think the listening and the uh, accomplice work is really where I see um, poetry having a really great tool and, and great power um, to recognize uh, what those experiences are like and to also take time to sort of inspect and um, understand the privileges that we carry. Uh, I think a lot of the work that poetry does is, is positionality um, or perspective taking, which is something I try to prioritize in my work. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. That was really, really great. I'm glad that, I'm glad that you submitted your, your work to this and that everyone had a chance to hear it. Um, the next person is Bill Darty, and uh, he is, he submitted in addition to, um, the piece you heard earlier, 
um, a one-act play called Fat, and he has a student, Malik Summers here, and the two of them are going to read an excerpt. It's a little, it runs a little bit over, but that's okay. We're, we're okay with that. It doesn't run a lot over. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. So Malik, you're unmuted, yeah? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. So it's, it's, um, it's Malik, actually. Um, and uh, he's uh, entering senior at uh, SUNY Cortland. And we've been uh, together for about three years, not together, but together uh, as student and teacher. Uh, and he's my voice uh, student. So uh, he read this uh, for me the other, other day and like the character, um, I'm playing Charles, who's an older uh, obese man. And uh, Lemuel is a younger, um, thin and very well-spoken young man who secretly or not so secretly loves Charles. Uh, but there are racial tensions between them. There are um, clearly an age difference and there's a background of the AIDS epidemic that influences the writing of this. So we're gonna do a quick little uh, lift from the uh, page 10 and we'll do the second ending, okay, uh, Malik, if you want to go to that. Oh, to Luau? Yeah. Okay. All right? All right. Charles, the doctor told you the last time we were in his office that you're now considered. Not that, 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 that. Told you that you're officially morbidly obese, and it's true, and you've got to address it. Eating the way you do is going to bring on diabetes and heart problems. And you act as though I stuff my face 24-7. You know, there are times I simply just forget to eat. No, there are times you simply forgot you just ate. <laughs> oh, ha, ha. Well, I don't appreciate the breach of my doctor-patient confidentiality. I'm your healthcare proxy. I know more about you than you do. You can't pretend what he said is invalid. You weigh nearly 400 pounds. Charles and I, for one, don't care to see you in an early grade. You need to go on a regimen and start working out. Well, that is not really likely to happen. And you're going to have to give up ice cream late at night and those sweet dessert wines you drink. I've never given up anything I like. Why would I? Even during Lent as a youth, I would only give up things I wouldn't miss. One year it was Brussels sprouts. Another it was cream soda, which I abhor to this day. Another year it was vaginas. I have never eaten, drank, nor prodded any of those items before I gave them up, and I certainly haven't since. I can give up things which I can live without, but I would rather die from living with too much of the things I love. May I quote you? If you can remember what I just said. <laughs> oh, from my memoirs? Oh, from your headstone. Oh, nonsense. I'm donating my body to science, and then I wish to be cremated. Well, what's ever left of me? Charles have you that someone could actually use. Your eyes are shot, your heart is enlarged, your lungs are damaged from all the years you smoked, and your liver is likely pickled from your decades of drinking port. Is this be cruel to Charles Knight? I'm feeling a bit more than dist. Charles, you may not use the word dist. It sounds ridiculous coming out of your mouth. I won't even say, say that silly word, so remove it from your arsenal. I... You know, Charles, I'm being completely serious. You do realize that you're too big to be cremated at this point. Whatever do you mean? Since when is someone too big to incinerate? It's true, Charles. I read where a man your size would refuse to sequest by mortuary because he wouldn't fit in their crematorium unless they chopped him up into pieces, which the family wouldn't hear of. Uh, uh, you're serious? <laughs> this isn't one of your tall tales, Uncle Remus, is it? <laughs> well... This puts a damper on my plans. Whoever would have thought? I mean, I figured I would burn for a fortnight like so much whale oil from days of yore, but I, I never thought I'd be able to fit into the ovens without being butchered like a wild boar at a luau. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. There. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah, you're not anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, my my question for you, Bill, is how much of your writing is autobiographical? <laughs> to use a question that you actually gave me. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Um, you know, I, I think any of us here uh, would 
and Carol included, um, would um, agree that any of our art is somewhat reflective of our lives. It has to be. Um, for that very same reason, uh, in my singing, I, I, I never sing about she, about her, about loving a, a woman. I don't have that experience. So I write from my experience. I live my truth uh, through my art. And uh, so in writing this, it's funny you should mention it. I had a gastric surgery a couple years ago. I was obese. I was bigger than I am now. And so Charles was much more uh, me back then when I wrote it in 2010. Uh, and uh, Lemuel is based on a friend who, unfortunately, I lost to AIDS some years back. But he was a beautiful man of color, uh, so well-spoken. And, uh, and, and he had a really lovely uh, affair with an older man and it was unrequited. So it was lifted a bit from the truth of Lemuel's story as well. Well, we'll have a, we'll have a chance to talk with um, Bill and Jean after, after the rest of the writers and uh, we have more questions for them. Uh, so thank you, Bill, that was great. Sure. Thank you. I was really glad that you um, that you read it together. Oh, good. Thanks. Thank you, <laughs> that was a that was a good Excellent. thought. Okay. Um, our the next writer we have is Mark Folk, who is from Buffalo State. Uh, Mark is also a faculty member, and his piece is called "Light Channels Light," which is a prayer for healing. Uh, I'm going to ask your question before you start, and you can answer it after you do your reading, if you don't mind. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in how you feel, how you view your role as an, as a poet um, during these times or other times. So. Well, thank you. Um, I think as someone, at least through my poetry, who reminds people what real values are, the values of love, the values of empathy, compassion. I work on that very much in my teaching. Um, as well, the values of acceptance. I, I teach literature and sometimes I think acceptance and empathy are what we teach in literature, even, um, even in despicable characters, you know, characters that we can see from a slightly different side or a di slightly different way. My poetry tries to express that an outlet sometimes for anger, um, but mostly it is a, 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 a beacon of hope and spirituality that is inclusive and, and connects us all to the values than we see that being expressed in our public world right now. Sorry about the muting and unmuting. Um, would, do you have your work there? Could you, could you read I do, it thank you for sending okay. it to me. You're welcome. Okay, Light Channels Light, a prayer for the Orlando LGBTQ victims and community. Light channels light, and that energy, the pulse of the universe, is found on Sparrow's wings and in her song. This vigil for LGBTQ and allies at Niagara Square Bow, amid white roses and rainbow flags, found its voice in song. We shall overcome, despite hate, despite death, for light channels light. This love fest of sharing, even in grief, out of determination that mass shooting targeted hate not happen again, not to this community, not in Buffalo, not in Orlando, nowhere. For light channels light, and healing comes with the breath, and with memory, and with tears, and with celebration. Light channels light. Thank you. Thank you. It's really beautiful Thank and you. really and really appropriate for for our times um i want to remind you all that that you can always follow up with any of the artists or writers if you wish uh, and you don't get your question in um you can chat with them or um and you can read the full you can read their full poems and the full plays and so forth on the website as well <laughs> Um, our next, excuse me, our, our next writer is Carissa Halston. She is from UAlbany. And I don't know if I am pronouncing this right. 
uh, but her work is called Momenvilk. And um, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna, she knows the question I'm gonna ask her. Um, after she reads her excerpt, I, I hope she will address uh, this question. I wanna know what her inspiration is for writing this piece, which involves um, First Nations, uh, a character who's a First Nations character that's quite significant. So uh, it's pronounced Momenalki. The V is pronounced like a U in Muskogee. So if you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the author's note, which is really brief at the top of the excerpt, uh, it says the Muskogee New Year occurs each summer, July and August uh, to coincide with the new harvest. So when you see a V, it's pronounced like a schwa, like a, a uh, right? Um, so I'm just gonna read the first page and a half. And this is an excerpt from a much longer project. Um, and so it's like I'm sharing an excerpt of an excerpt. <clears throat> After biking for days among trees and stones, Tasha rolled back into Ada just in time for New Year. They'd sweated through their tank and shorts and their hair had matted from a week of sleep in other people's homes. So they'd have to shower before getting changed and helping Aunt Reese with the food. It had always been their mother's thing, her and Reese proving to have sometimes made more than a whole. In this case, they'd made the whole feast and they'd brought the family together. Reese's father's side, the black side, and the side Reese and Tasha's mother shared, the creek side. So many people, a lot of mouths to feed. Plus this year would have been the first Reese cooked as the matriarch. Tasha couldn't let her cook alone. The feast made the fast possible, and the fast made the day holy, and nobody should have to carry the weight of a holiday on their own. But the green corn ceremony was more than a holiday. From the menu to the table settings, the meal itself was a ritual, a tribute to the land. Aunt Reese set the table to mirror the ceremonial grounds, a basket of fry bread, and the end of the honey they'd harvested last summer. Pitchers of sassafras tea boiled off the bark they'd pulled from last year's saplings. Cups of cold softy and bowls of warm softy from the last of last year's corn. Roasted squash from the ones Reese had canned over a week during winter solstice. Platters of blood sausage, the last of the pig they'd raised last spring from a runt. And side by side, beef jerky and tripe Reese had cured and canned for the feast. She also fried chicken for the picky eaters. Traditions inside traditions. And no dish had a prized position over any other on the table. No standing on ceremony in this house, not even the green corn variety. Reese arranged each dish as a stop in a rectangle along the table's edge, placed to represent the mounds that held the houses on Ada's ceremonial plaza. And in the center, the space between the mounds, bottles marked the place for the fire. Ketchup, mustard, hot sauce, and relish assembled in a rough cross, each facing one of the cardinal directions where the arbors stood in the plaza. And the napkins Reese folded in the shape of swans, though she always called them thunderbirds, were meant to be families, the creeks who'd come to honor the forthcoming year, to build the new mound and maintain the old ones to dance and pray in the open. The table was all that and a meal. Tasha's half-white half -white cousins called it extra. Aunt Reese trying too hard. So none of them would show up to help out, but they'd all show up to eat. And afterward, they'd go to the mounds to preen. On the way, they'd text every Indian in their contacts, Happy New Year, see you at the grounds? Then they'd all pose in the midsummer Midwestern heat for the official family photos. Baskets in hand, some filled with dirt, they'd either put on their stoic expressions or bare their teeth or hide their teeth to show respect or joy. Along the way, they'd show off the beads that bugled from their ears to their shoulders or the locks of their hair they'd wrapped in satin or the feathers they'd pinned to the leather bands they'd tied to their necks and arms and thighs decked to their eyes on the days they could wear regalia and not stand out. Thank you. <laughs> That's sweet.
that's sweet and weird, like like seeing this and not hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a wonderful story. I'm, and I encourage you all to read the rest of it on, on the website. Um, so, so Chris, what is your familiarity with the culture? And um, so my mother's side is Muscogee, uh, but I was not raised with a lot of exposure to my mother because I am a child of divorce, which has its own complications. Um, but I am Syrian and Native American and Irish and Polish. Um, so being a person of mixed race, like we talk about representation and it, it's never, you're not going to see that specific mix. Like you're, and, and that's fine. Cause I, I don't need that, <laughs> but in kind of deciding what this chapter was going to be, cause it's part of this longer book that is loosely based on a different book, which is about imperialism and, and weirdly um, the, the trip that Marco Polo took for Kublai Khan. But that's longer than I have, uh, that would take longer to explain than I have time for. Um, but basically it's a book that has no women in it, but it has a lot of chapters based on cities and all of the cities are named after women. So there's this kind of like hint toward women in the book, even though there aren't any there. So similarly, a lot of the uh, city names in the project have either androgynous, androgynous names or they have um, women's names. And because the book is set in America and the book is essentially about America, there's no way to write about this country without writing about Native Americans and without writing about Black and African Americans. So I really specifically tried to focus on the many, many Black Native Americans there are in like across communities. Um, but there's this idea that like you have to be one or the other. And in fact, throughout history, there have been many who have been both. Um, and telling one story without the other is like telling half the story. So it's a lot of research, but it's part of what I'm doing for my doctoral work. So. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> well, it's really great. I really appreciate you being here to read this for us and submitting it. Um, our, our final writer is Carol Jewell. And she is, uh, oh, I didn't write down what it was from. Carol, you're from UAlbany, is that right? Where are you from? And uh, your piece is called Lesbian Bowling League. That's correct. Yeah. and. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the question ahead of time as well and hope that you'll talk about it afterwards. Okay. Um, you tell it, you tell in your uh, explanation in, uh, in the application that this is a true experience. And I want to know what year it took place. And I want to know how organizations like this Lesbian Bowling League, um, how, I want to know about their importance in the struggle for acceptance of LGBTQ, um, especially lesbian women. Um, so, okay, <laughs> it's all yours. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read first and then I'll try to answer your question. Um, in terms of when it happened, uh, to maybe 2001, maybe, something like that, I don't remember. I'm a, I'm a senior lesbian, so I don't always remember everything. But anyway, let me, let me read my poem. Lesbian Bowling League. I once belonged to an all-woman's bowling league. Okay, okay, it was an all-lesbian league. 
There were dikes of all shapes, sizes, colors, ages. Anyone would think they'd hit a gold mine of gay gals. I don't even remember which lesbian first invited us to play. Who knew whom, you ask? Everyone knew everyone. We were family. A gold mine of gals, gentlewomen, femmes, ladies, bitches, all with the same goal, a 300 game, 12 strikes. Everyone knew everyone. Everyone was gay. I admit I didn't know there were so many lesbians who liked to bowl. So we joined their sapphic alliance. I admit I didn't know there was a community of lesbian bowlers just waiting to add us to their teams. So we joined their sapphic alliance and learned a lot of new words and got better at bowling. We were always picked last as kids, but these women wanted us. Dykes of all kinds, images, clothing, schooling, single and not. Our bowling improved and our courage was enhanced once we joined that all women's bowling league. Thank you very much. What was the question? Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to tell you that your, your poem just tickles me. Just tickles me. I had somehow in my head that it, it came from like the 1960s. Oh no. Uh, but I, I want to know about um, the importance of this kind of organization to you personally and how you feel about it, some, these organizations' importance to um, the LGBTQ uh, community. Well, at the time that this happened, I had just come out. I was 39. I came out at 39. And prior to that, I had been married to a man. I thought I was straight. Everyone who knew me thought I was straight. We had a baby together. And um, then uh, we, we were married and subsequently divorced. And I went out with a few more men. And it, you know nothing really lasted um, until I saw Aretha Franklin on TV. And I thought, oh. That's what those feelings are. Aha! When I started at the University of Albany, everybody thought it was gay. And um, so, give or take 21 years ago, you Albany, like a lot of institutions, not just um, institutions of higher learning, but police departments, um, different community organizations uh, like them, the University of Albany was a member of the National Coalition Building Institute, NCBI. And without going into too much information about that, basically it's a program that, uh, in which we can tell our stories to other people. And by telling our stories, we hope to reduce prejudice and build allies and coalitions. Well, I went to an NCBI training and I saw some colleagues there. And I also knew, I saw, saw a bunch of people that I didn't know that day. Long story short, at 39, I came out to 60 people at the same time. Six zero people at the same time. People I had worked with for 15 years who didn't know. And then these people that only knew me as lesbian. Um, I think, I think having, um, sports teams specifically for people of a particular group or who identify in a certain way and not just LGBTQ, but also, um, people who have hearing impairments, people who have dyslexia, you know, they find and we find our tribe, if you will, and we can relax and we can come there and we can do what, what we were meant to do there, which is in my case, bowl and, and get better at bowling. Um, not where we're, we have other experiences where we are one of only a few 
and we have to spend our time either defending what group we belong to or groups we belong to um, or we have to pretend our feelings aren't getting hurt no matter our age um, so I, th I think um, it's important maybe more important for younger people than older people because basically I've reached an age where you don't like it that I'm a lesbian I don't give a shit 21 years ago I cared that I did care, and now I don't really care. My wife and I have been together 20, almost 22 years, married for eight years. Um, we're gonna be, we're grandmothers already, and we're gonna be grandparents again in August. And, you know, another thing that we've had to, that we've had to um, answer to, or decide if we're gonna answer is when um, non, lesbian people um primarily straight people um ask us about the gay lifestyle and then i have to say oh let me let me describe my gay lifestyle to you i wake up in the morning and i don't want to get out of bed but i have to get out of bed because i have to go to work and now that we're under this pandemic my work is in my dining room but i still have to go so before I go, I eat a bowl of cereal and I'm, I'm really enjoying this lesbian lifestyle. It's so exciting, it's so much fun. And then I sit in front of my computer for eight hours and I do my work. And then, uh, you know, the evening comes and my wife and I like to play cribbage. We play a couple games of cribbage and we eat dinner and then we go to bed. That's our lesbian lifestyle. It's not so different from, you know, anyone else. And so that's why this poem was important to me, because lesbians go bowling. They, you know, there's the place you can throw axes now, you know, axe throwing. There's places where you, you can do everything. And um, it, it's nice to be able to, to go out in the world and not have to worry about how other people are judging you because they do judge us yeah well i really i really appreciate your <laughs> you're sharing this with us with all of us um, um from from here we have we have one two three five five faculty and i'm hoping that you all will unmute yourselves and answer a couple of questions and answer questions from students. In fact, if you are a student and you have a question, go for it, okay? But I'm gonna lead with one question that I'd like you all to think about and you can weigh in on it. Um, what would you most want to share with the student artists who are here? Um, well, I'll start, Jennifer, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so, uh, my name is Julia Jaquette, and I teach at um, Fashion Institute of Technology, and I'm also currently the chair of the Fine Arts Department. Um, and I would say, and I don't know, um, that you should, uh, I guess I would say that the life of being able to express yourself through artwork is fantastic um, and incredibly satisfying, although never ever rely on it for uh, making a living. Um, but it's gonna, uh, and that is not a bad thing at all. And here you have a bunch of faculty who are saying the life of being an artist and a teacher works really well. Uh, and you can find incredible solace in making art in times like this right now, right? This time of un unbelievable social change and a pandemic. And um, so consider yourself very lucky and blessed to um, be able to, to uh, th have an artistic practice. So that's what I would, I would uh, 
young artists and then also uh, colleagues here. I'll mute myself. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Julia. I want to I want to hear from the others of you as well. Um, I think. I think a couple of things about that. I think it's great that human beings have art and music and words and other um, medium, media to express whatever they want to express. And it doesn't matter what medium you use. Love is love. I'll go. Um, I guess a perspective I'd like to share is that because I'm a man of a certain age, uh, having come up through the, um, the ranks and living in New York City most of my life and making my living in the arts, uh, I, um, I didn't really ever feel there was a choice. Um, and I want to clarify that. Um, because first of all, those of us who are gay know or by or whatever, we don't have a, a choice in it. We have a choice whether to acknowledge it or not. But see, you are either gay, bi, or straight. When I was coming up through the ranks, there was no gender fluidity. There was no, you know, the trans, we didn't understand any of that. And so any of the prejudice that you young um, LGBTQ folks are coming up against realize you're going to get some of that from some of the elders in the community because I'm constantly having to learn what the they them those is and and how I've held I've had three students so far that have uh, uh, transitioned and one of them I had to help legally uh, get the name changed because uh, his parents wouldn't allow it um, so I've been a fierce defender and champion for the younger generation that are now coming up with all these initials that us old folks are having a hard time keeping up with. But the thing is, I, I appreciate everybody for their perspective in life. And I don't really care whether it's sexuality or creed or color. Um, and I think that the thing that Carol just said was, is true. Love is, is ultimately the way that if we were to view every single person that we encounter, including the art that we make. I mean, there's not a single piece of art I've created that wasn't from a place of love. I really think that that seems to be the answer because even the most prejudiced of my family members, and I've got some redneck Republicans in my family, when they found out that I was gay, that Billy was gay, they had to stop and go, wait, but we love him. And it's changed the perspective of my family and the way that they look at gay people. And I have defenders now on my side that you never would have expected. So I think that that idea, and I know it sounds trite, but if we were all to come at one another, no matter what, through that place of love and that our art reflects that, people can't help but respond positively. And that's always been my experience. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> I saw you raise your hand. Yes, yeah. uh, me, Jeannie. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to come at this from another angle because absolutely that we love what we do is, uh, is imperative. If you don't love it, you should not expect to have a life in the arts because it's just too hard. Um, which doesn't mean that you can't exercise your artistry in some way. Um, as, as, as something meaningful. I mean, I have, uh, as a musician, it's a slightly, uh, as, a, as a performing musician, as opposed to a, a composer, although I work a lot with composers, um, I am a medium. I am not, I am the person through which the art actually can be uh, something that is expressed to a larger audience. And in that way, one of the things that I love about what I do is that when it's um, when it's really happening, I am not present. I am the filter through which this thing happens. And so if I were to translate that into 
into other art forms, and I do work with a lot of different artists in a lot of different medium. Um, uh, there's something about allowing yourself to not be present so that the art can be present. And of course, we all have to develop our crafts and that's a very particular thing. But then when you are employing your craft toward the thing that you want to express, to give yourself almost the out um, that in some way it's larger than you, it's not you, so that you don't have to let how you're feeling that day or your particular whatever you perceive your identity to be get in the way of the thing that's happening inside that needs to come out. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but to me, uh, you know, I have uh, students all the time that uh, we talk about the difference between performing and practicing or having an end result as opposed to being in a studio. And the more they can be not in their headspace about themselves, but focus that towards the thing that's going to be happening, the, um, the more uh, sort of the more, the more joyous or the more kind of grounded, um, uh, and fulfilling it can be, because then it's something that really is a gift. So, my thoughts. <laughs> Hi, I don't know if you can see my hand raised. Yes. Um, this is piggybacking, but also kind of being a devil's advocate to things that people have said, and I'm coming at it not as a member of the LGBTQ community, but as an immigrant. Um, but something I've been thinking about a lot, especially in this crisis, is that it's never too late to change your course. And this is not me talking you out of being in the arts by any means, but your course in any area of your life. Uh, I'm a, a woman of a certain age, I guess, and I'm thinking that my parents were my age when we emigrated from the Soviet Union, and they had to change every single thing, language, culture. Uh, my mother's an accountant, and accounting is very different in communism than in capitalism, and you know, she went back to school for many years. Uh, and, and so, whatever this means to you, whether it's an artist or a human or a member of a community or even sometimes a member of a family, it is never too late to say, today I'm going to change my life, today I'm going to change my mind, and today I'm going to do something else or live in a different way. That's all. Well, I just wanted to add a couple of things. One is to stand firm in your own truth. Stand with an open hand. Know that that truth will evolve. That truth will change. And it's important you stand there in it and put yourself in it. And a couple of things in relationship to that. Know that you have allies. You will find your own community where you're given support and given love. If you do not feel comfortable in a given group or a given community, leave that group. There's more than, you know, there's more than school of fish in the ocean. Find your group, but also find your inner self. You know, solitude, very important part of my spirituality as well as my writing and my teaching. And I, I think solitude is very important to nurture the self and take care of the self and take time out. Uh, the world doesn't want us to take time apart, but we need to do that for ourselves. And my final, um, my final expression about this is, is one of stay safe. You know, there are parts of the country, the part I'm from, for instance, where it's not safe for GLBTQ plus folks. Um, and social media, which many people confuse with uh, being a bubble, hell yeah, let's create the bubble because that should be a place of support. Now, I come from a small, very, very small Appalachian town. My grad, high, way, high school graduating class was 22. I was actually class president. And one of the things I discovered in the last couple of years, uh, social media, is that I have to unfriend people I grew up with because they're abusive, because they're still bullies, because they've never supported who I am and they don't support my other friends. Uh, it's very hard when you have a class of 22 who's trying to stay connected on Facebook. 
but I've actually had to block people to create a community that I could live in there and that I could support former students, others of mine, and GLBTQ plus folks that I know and love. Um, so stay safe, stay in your own truth, find your communities because they're out there. Thank you, Mark. Um, Joe, I think you're, you're keeping track of the time. We may be out of time. We, we have been out of time for quite some time. <laughs> but this has been such a great, um, a great afternoon and evening with you all. I, I can't tell you how, um, how full my heart is. And I want to thank you all for, for joining us and for contributing. I want to thank you faculty for sharing um, so generously with the students. And I want to thank you students for, for um, going through all the work to submit your works, and, um, which is a pain. And, um, and I hope you all hang in there through the rest of COVID and that I can see you in person uh, before too long. <laughs> well, I, I want to I say that uh, I uh, apologize for not being a better timekeeper, but I was moved by what I was hearing and seeing, and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, <laughs> But uh, we are at the end of our, our time. And I will, did want to, uh, before we, we leave, I did want to ask Chloe Jean if she would tell everyone about the uh, SUNY Pride event that's coming up. Absolutely. Chloe, can you do that? Absolutely. I just wanted to say thank you, everybody. I will um, move through this quickly, and we can also send the details afterwards. But on Thursday, hopefully some of you have seen, we are hosting a two-hour virtual event. Um, unfortunately, right now, the event is currently sold out at an amazing 500 attendees, but if spots do become available, we will be sure to send the registration details around to this group first, um, and we will be posting a recording of the event to the Pride webpage, but um, our first hour of content uh, on Thursday, we're going to be recapping and celebrating SUNY Pride and what we've been working on. Um, our MC is Mrs. Kasha Davis, a celebrity drag queen and former contestant of RuPaul, RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, we're going to be doing things like premiering our SUNY transformation video, which features members of the SUNY community going from quarantine drab to SUNY fab. And that is set to Lady Gaga's Born This Way, which is going to be performed by some of the Stony Brook uh, marching band members and features FIT alumni and fashion designer Jerome Lamar. We're also going to be highlighting this SUNY Pride art exhibition and driving a lot of attendance to the website to make sure that everyone can see our incredible pieces. Um, and Mrs. Kasha Davis will be having a short conversation with Bill Doherty and Carol Jewell to discuss their institutional SUNY history and how being a member of the LGBTQ community influences their art. Um, and also I wanted to mention to everyone, we've put a call to action out for the entire SUNY community and alumni to share their personal stories of LGBTQ plus history and experiences with SUNY. So we'll be showing that call to action video. Um, and any of you can go to our SUNY Pride website and share your story. And the second hour of our event, which will be streamed uh, live on YouTube, so make sure that you're following SUNY on YouTube, is going to be a virtual dance party, which is hosted by DJ and sexual assault and trauma awareness advocate Zeke Thomas. So that'll be a really empowering and exciting uh, hyped up hour of a virtual dance party. So. I also really quickly wanted to mention um, a you're hearing it here first kind of event. Tomorrow we are launching registration for our final event of the month. Um, a lot of the conversation naturally led in this direction tonight, so I wanted to uh, make sure I mentioned it. But Tuesday, June 30th at 3 p.m., we're going to be having a virtual panel discussion, and it's called Stonewall to SUNY. And we're going to be focusing on the intersection of the LGBTQ plus uh, activism and Black Lives Matter movements. Um, and in this pivotal moment of racial, racial reckoning during LGBTQ plus Pride Month, we honor and support the members and people of color in both communities who are doing tireless work right now. Um, it's moderated by our senior vice chancellor for strategic initiatives and chief diversity officer, Terry Miller, and we have some incredible panelists that are on board. So we will make sure that you get that information tomorrow morning as well, and make sure that you all get to register for that event. Chloe Jean, thank you very much. Absolutely. And I just wanted to say to everyone that uh, uh, I, I just could not cut things shorter than they were uh, because you moved me in the most positive way. And I feel I'm a richer person because of this event. So thank you very much. And Jennifer, I'm going to let you have the final word. Okay. Well, <laughs> so I, I want to remind you 
where you can go to um, to see the full exhibit at suny.edu backslash pride. And if you just Google SUNY Pride right now, it comes up. And uh, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening. And I look forward to seeing more. And um, <laughs> happy Pride, everyone. Happy Thanks Pride. For having us.